This is the Ted Wallachian Podcast. Brought to you by Tom's Place. For the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices, it's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. And Helenda's The Meat People. Enjoy their award-winning products at selected Metro, Sobeys, Fortino's, and Foodland locations. Helenda's The Way Sausage Should Taste. And now, here's Ted. This year marks the 51st anniversary of Don McLean's iconic song, American Pie. McLean is a Grammy Award honoree, a member of the Songwriter Hall of Fame, and a BBC Lifetime Achievement Award recipient. American Pie has been listed by the Record Industry of America in the top five songs of the 20th century. The song resides in the Library of Congress National Recording Registry. The original handwritten manuscript was auctioned in 2015 for $1.2 million. A long, long time ago, I can still remember how that music used to make me smile. And I knew if I had my chance, I could make those people dance. Maybe they'd be happy for a while. But February made me shiver With every paper I deliver Bad news on the doorstep I couldn't take one more step I can't remember if I cried When I read about his widowed bride But something touched me deep inside the day The music died So sing it with me. So bye-bye, Miss American Pie. A little louder. Roll my Chevy to the levee, but the levee will drive. Them good old boys are drinking whiskey and rye. Singing this will be the day that I die. This will be the day that I die. Don McLean, it's a real pleasure to chat with you. I thank you for taking the time. You're in the middle of a tour right now celebrating the 51st anniversary of American Pie. Where are you now? This is um, a world tour that I am starting, which I have started in February. I won't give you all the dates we've done, but we've done a lot of them. And I just got back from Disney World. And then next week we start pretty much every weekend. And then in the fall we go overseas and do a... The wonderful uh, English, Irish, Scandinavian, European leg, and then next year more American dates, and then Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific Rim, where I have been going for 50 years. Uh, Wow. So, you know, we've all been through this pandemic. My fingers are crossed that uh, (laughs) we can uh, do all these shows, and I'm doing them. So, uh, you know, I, I, and I like that mask in the airport. I think that's a very good thing to do. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting when, when the pandemic hit, and I've introduced and interviewed so many musicians over, over the years, that when the pandemic hit, it just crippled the entertainment industry. And it was, you yeah. know, at, at one point I remember thinking, you know, when it hit, that was the day the music died. Yeah, in modern terms, and all these all these theaters, they have to have foot traffic. You know, they have to have people. My God, I mean, uh, Disney, for example, has seventy five thousand workers. It's a, in Disney World is a sixty mile square uh, <laughs> enterprise. All right, and they put all of their people uh, into different jobs and kept them working when the entertainment went down the tubes and then brought them back because, you know, you just can't find guys to do sound uh, on every street corner. You know, you need these people. They're specific. So they were smart to keep them going so they had their their trained people. Uh, I hope the airlines did the same thing because, you know, you mm-hmm. just can't uh, tear apart a team that has to work every day together 
and give them a two year break and say, what do I do? How does this work? You know, I mean, Mm -hmm. you don't want that when you're flying. When you released uh, American Pie, it was originally released as a, on an album, and it was picked up and played by a lot of you who were very popular on, on FM stations, album-oriented music stations. And then when it, was, it, it came across to AM stations, which were really still the predominant music stations at the time in, in the early 70s, there were a lot of radio stations who said, we, we can't play this thing, it's way too long. It's 8 minutes and 42 seconds. It's like twice as long as, as most songs, so... The record company released it as a double-sided single? No, it, what happened, I'll tell you the whole little story. Uh, United Artists bought the album uh, from Media Arts Records, which was started by Alan Livingston, who was a, a legend uh, in the world of uh, uh, phonograph records. He created the modern uh capital records that we know he signed sinatra the beatles the beach boys the kingston trio all these big acts uh who were at the top of every particular segment of the music business and created a whole powerful new company in capital records he then retired and formed in the late 1960s media arts records and with a guy named bob york who was a major person at rca uh, in the Angel Division, which was classical. There were two amazingly uh, smooth California guys who really knew their stuff. And Alan discovered me after I'd been turned down by a lot of record companies. He was mm-hmm. so proud of having me on the label. He put out Tapestry, which was the hardest album I ever got out, but is the footprint to every album that I've ever made since. And uh, I made the second album, American Pie, for him, but he couldn't keep going. United Artists came in and bought the record company on the strength, really, of the American Pie album, which they loved. Uh, There was also a lady named Dory Previn who made some lovely records with some very good songs. And there was Spencer Davis, who made... Um, an album and there was a, a a word album called The Begatting of the President which was a <laughs> Alan Livingston was <laughs> interested in these kind of things which had was Orson Welles uh, talking about wow. Nixon and it was a pretty interesting <laughs> piece to find these days but anyway um, the Tapestry album had been extremely successful in underground radio, FM radio. And so I was an emerging uh, singer and songwriter who had a lot of uh, gravitas because of the songs on that record and because of the way that the FM people loved it and respected it. Boom, I was in. The next thing, and American Pie came out on the United Artists record label. And they took the song American Pie, cut it down to three minutes, and it became number one. Well, now the FM people thought that I had sold out. Yeah. You know, oh, you're just a hit maker now, huh? You know, yeah, but yeah. meanwhile, they still were playing the record on FM radio. So the FM listeners, there were millions of them called the AM station and said that that little three-minute version is not the version. The version is the eight-and-a-half-minute version. And so they were um, they were criticized and shamed <laughs> into playing the eight-and-a-half-minute version <laughs> as number one. And so that's how that became uh, number one and had that record for 50 years of being the longest song ever. Um and then they didn't have the technology to put eight and a half minutes on one side of a of a 45, so they split it up into part one and part two. That was the second iteration, you know, and release of the song. Mm-hmm. The short one and then the double-sided one. And, and so from 1971, from when the time it was released, in, in 71, 72, when, when it became number one on Billboard's uh, uh, Hot 100, it began a record for the longest song. That's a, that's a song in, in terms of its length. To reach number one, 
a record which sat until 2021, which was broken by uh, Taylor Swift and her recording of All Too Well. And for that, she sent you a lovely note and a bouquet of flowers. Were you surprised? You know, I don't think people, I don't think they care. They have their own lives. Why should they care? I don't know a lot about what's going on. You know, I don't follow uh, trends. I write my thing, write my song, say what I have to say, and I have a whole lot of other things that I like to do. And then I go out and sing my shows, and I'll talk and sing and do this stuff, and the audiences love it, and they, I love them, and they love me, and it's a beautiful experience. I don't. I knew that Taylor Swift was uh, extremely successful for a very long time, at least a decade. Mm-hmm. And then I read somewhere that she didn't realize that she did not own her albums, all those hit albums. And I gave an interview and I said something that I didn't even know her at the time. I said she had a bad lawyer because the lawyer should have told her that. Yeah, that shouldn't come as a surprise to the biggest star in the world. It wouldn't right. come as a surprise to Garth Brooks, I can tell you that right now. <laughs> so it came to us as a surprise to her. So what does she do? She goes and re-records all the records, and people like them actually better than the originals, and that All Too Well song is longer than the original one yep. <clears throat> and becomes number one, and we have this unseating of, of American Pie after 50 years. So I wrote her a lovely quote, and... Uh, I do think that she's a a terrific example for young people. When you look, and I've raised two children, when you look out there at what parents have to go through in order to get some civility in their children's heads, and you see this garbage that's out there and this behavior, when a guy getting an Oscar can walk up to another man and slap him in the face... At the Oscars, we are um, we're living we're in a tree or a cave somewhere. That's caveman stuff. Yep. So she's not like that, you know. She's the other way, and so she sent me this lovely um, uh, note, and and then you know I said, well, she's a very classy lady. That's how I was brought up, you know. I mean, that's the way yeah. I was brought up. The Ted Wallisham Podcast continues after this. And as usual, off we go to 190 Baldwin, the home of Tom's Place. It's in the heart of Kensington Market. We've been talking for a little bit, Tom, about the uh, wedding season upon us. And I hearken back some, oh, I think it's eight years now since uh, my daughter got married. And I remember bringing in my, my son and my son-in-law, future son-in-law at the time. And everybody decided that as opposed to getting tuxedos, all of the bridegrooms were going to get really nice dark suits with matching ties so that after the wedding, two weeks, three weeks later, they could continue to wear those suits. And they looked fabulous. Now, not to say that you shouldn't get a tuxedo because you've got some terrific tuxedos, which I have too. So either one works. But if you're thinking, well, do I want a tux and how often am I going to wear it? Maybe the suit it works best. That, you know, that's a very good observation. And, and, and you did the right thing. And it's very common where people come into our store with the groom and the groomsmen and they're buying fabulous, fantastic suits. And you're going to get much more wear out of a suit than of a tuxedo. Exactly correct. So please come to Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin Street. Great storytelling that I always love how you tell the stories. I tell them from my heart. One day they balls out of the heart of Kensington Market. That's where you'll find my friend Tom and Tom's place. Hey, let me take a moment to tell you about my friends at Helenda's. They are the meat people. You know, I've been a fan of their products for years now, and without a doubt, they make some of the best sausage in Ontario. They are multiple award winners, having captured the Ontario's finest meat competitions, coveted award of excellence on three occasions, in addition to dozens of individual product awards. Hollandez has also received the Grand Champion Ribbon at the past two Royal Winter Fairs Ready to Eat Meat Snack Competitions. 
So whether you're preparing a charcuterie board or a full-blown sit-down dinner for your friends or family, you'll find Helenda's award-winning products at fine meat shops throughout the province, now including selected Metro, Sobeys, Fortino's, and Foodland stores, along with their seven Helenda's locations. Their barbecued kielbasa is my favorite. On a fresh bun with horseradish, it is out of this world. But don't just take my word for it. Judge for yourself. On your barbecue, in your kitchen, or straight from the refrigerator. Helenda's, the way sausage should taste. Now back to Ted and his guest. Don McLean is my special guest this week. There have been so many different theories bandied about what what American Pie means the day the music died. Is it about the death of Buddy Holly and Richie Valens and and the Big Bopper? And I guess that's part of the story. But for me, what I get out of this, and and tell me if I'm wrong, because I have been many times before, but but in American Pie, in essence, is it not about the loss of innocence, about about the changing times in the United States and what was is no longer? Well, you know, people say that, but I think American Pie... Uh, uh, I think people are losing their innocence all the time. Mm -hmm. I think we lost our innocence in the Depression. We lost our innocence in World War II. We lost our innocence, certainly, when Kennedy and RFK and Martin Luther King were killed all by the government. Those weren't lone assassins that did that. I mean, they're still covering up and not releasing the information from the Kennedy assassination 60-some years later. That's just proof yeah. positive that the government is part of the cover-up. Why not let us see it? What's the difference? They're covering it up because they're part of the conspiracy. And it's very easy to figure this out. So everybody realized this stuff. That's a loss of innocence right there. You know, um, I think that since then, the cynicism we you you have to in order i think to be happy and i hate to say this but you have to have a certain blissfulness uh in life and uh, at least in childhood and children now and this is why i like this little children's book that we're coming out with and there'll be other ones Give them a little story or something in an age when they don't have to know that the environment is is bad or that you know there's all this bad stuff out there. Um, I think this is the rise of uh, you know suicide and people beca- be behaving um, in very self-destructive ways, cutting themselves and all this other stuff. You know I couldn't even imagine growing up. Um, Vincent, you know, I would sing this from ne- uh, from time to time in the last two years on one show or another. I didn't do too many appearances, of course, in those two years, but I would say that uh, Pete Seeger, who I loved and I knew for a few years, he said, Don, don't ever kill yourself. He said, you never know what's going to happen next. You never know what's going to happen next. And there were... And I mentioned that at the end of the song. I said, you're out there. I know a lot of people are feeling so hopeless. Learn to soldier on. Put one foot in front of the other. Get everything you can out of every day. Fight on. Fight on. You cannot get anything in life without a struggle. You must struggle. And that's the nature of life. So if you think that things aren't going well because, you know, you want to be on the red carpet of life, that's not life. You know, struggle, yeah. fight. You mentioned Vincent, the the, the brilliant song, the, the the homage to Vincent Van Gogh, who the brilliant yet yet so so troubled artist who, who took his own his own life. As as I listen, and you, you're such a tremendous lyricist, and and I think that 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 stands up in Vincent, the song Vincent, more than any of the other songs. It just it seems to me that as you were writing this, you were almost it's almost as though you had a paintbrush in hand and you were painting these these beautiful lyrics and, and these beautiful pictures about this beautiful yet troubled man. Starry, starry nights Paint your palette blue and gray Look out on a summer's day 
With eyes that know the darkness in my soul Shadows on the hills Sketch the trees and the daffodils Catch the breeze and the winter chills In colors on the snowy linen land Well, when I, when I came up with the idea to do the song, I loved the idea, and I never heard of anybody thinking about that. You know, we were in a very highly competitive environment back in 1969 and 70. We had the Beatles, we had the Stones, we had Bob Dylan, yeah. we, had, uh, we had all sorts of other writers from Canada and around the country who were be- writing beautiful things. And we had an audience that we knew was going to be receptive to something that was beautiful and wonderful. Uh, that's not the case now. You know, those people have grown old. We have a whole bunch of other people. Basically, they're, all they care about is, is dance music. So mm-hmm. it was a different an audience. But what, when I came up with the idea, I, I said, well, this, always try to go to the simplest way, not make things too complicated. You know, Jerry Lewis, the comedian, once said, don't make the regular guy think that you're smarter than he is. And that's a good bit of show business advice. Yeah. You're not smarter than he is. In fact, you're not as good as he is because I couldn't hold a job. You know, I just do what I want to do. I've been very lucky. I'm not as good as the average working guy, and I know that. But anyway, I decided how can I simply say this? And I said, wow, you know, his Starry Night painting is his essence, at least in terms of what people may think. So Mm -hmm. I just looked at the painting and let the the painting tell me what to say. And that's what happened. The painting basically wrote the song. Right. That that makes makes an infinite amount amount of of, of sense. Are are you an artist at all? what, What do you do for hobbies? What what's that? What do I do for? Yeah, but for the, the your hobbies, part time, uh, oh, past times. Uh, do you paint? Because there's a lot of musicians well, who do paint. No, no, I don't. Sculpt. I don't need it. Singing and playing guitar are my hobbies, and I've made them into my li- livelihood. Yeah. I do what I love to do the best. I love my guitars. I love singing. I love traveling. I love Western things. I love horses, and uh, I design things. I love antiques. I collect antiques. I have. Four homes that are full of antiques. I've designed all the rooms. I love that. I um, I'm interested in everything. Uh, I love the Gilded Age. I love different a- 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 different ages of architecture. I love the um, uh, now I'm out in California in Palm Springs. I love the desert modern uh, mm-hmm. whole thing. It's all a different thing. And all my, my Western stars are out here, you know, Hopalong Cassidy and Gene Autry and everything else. So I'm, mm-hmm. I've come full circle now. I'm where I'm going to stay. Uh, but I've loved all that. I'm, I'm fascinated with it and history. And I mean, I just have films. I'm a film buff. I've probably I collected 16 millimeter films. I probably got 300 of them. So wow. I have a lot of things going. I design everything. I design my clothes, my, you know, you know, whatever it is, I got my hands in it. You're a busy man. You And uh, obviously, the idea of touring is daunting to some people, especially now, as we touched on briefly with, with the pandemic and just all the changes that, 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 we, that have undergone, we've undergone in, in, in the travel industry, people in the travel industry have undergone. You you enjoy it to the point where you're spending a vast amount of time and covering an awful lot of space doing that, whereas a lot of people would be saying, I don't need to do this. And you financially don't need to do this. I have not felt normal until now. I've started <laughs> touring now. I've started traveling. I've started dealing with the um, the rigors of the airport and flights and this and that. Now suddenly I'm normal again. This is how I got to be. Yeah. So uh, it's what I'm designed to do, and I enjoy all of it. I enjoy being in the airport and seeing the people. 
I have seen so many things in airports, um, unbelievable things with parents who have children in uh, wheelchairs or worse with and there's you look on their faces they're totally devoted to their children and, and they're such saintly people i mean they're everywhere nobody has a life like i do you know where you get money and applause and people telling you how <laughs> wonderful you are all day that's not <laughs> life for most people no, you know but you not. see it in the airport you really see it you know the the struggles that people go through and what they're in, into and i of course, I fantasize about all this. You know, I remember it all, and I'll use it in, in in some kind of song. And maybe that song will come around and help that person, or make them happier, or make them feel a little better about themselves. And I'll give them a little bit of a lift. And that's kind of what I try to do. Yeah, well, and you've done it for years, and I'm glad that you're continuing to do it. Don McLean, thank you very much for your time. I look thank forward you. to seeing you. In, Tor- in Toronto, all the best. I can't so. wait. The Ted Walsh and Podcast has been brought to you by Tom's Place. For the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices, it's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. And Helenda's, the meat people. Enjoy their award winning products at selected Metro, Sobeys, Fortinos, and Foodland locations. Helenda's, the way sausage should taste. The Ted Walsh and Podcast is produced by Joey Roselli. Technical production by Paul Gatt. Music by Bike Thieves. I'm Becky Coles. Submit your questions and comments to ted at twmedia.ca.